my friend and my candidate, Mr. Adam Kokesh. Thank you, Ben. Hello, Colorado! Always good to come back here. A lot of really strong, passionate libertarians in this state. So this is the third national tour that I've done like this, and we're coming to the end of it now. Last week, very exciting. We did it backwards this time, or forwards if you want to go with clockwise here. And it's great to be ending with all this momentum coming into Colorado. And one of the things that I really enjoy about touring like this is how we step out of the typical libertarian bubbles, right? You know, like online, obviously we control our feeds, our stream of information, but then there's events like this where we come together to pat ourselves on the back for being right about everything. <laughs> and then somehow by the end of the night we find ourselves arguing about everything. And then next thing you know, you're all a bunch of socialists. <laughs> so there's that bubble. And when we tour, you know, we have the Freedom Mobile, we have the rig with the big Freedom logos on it, so people stop and ask, what's Freedom? And I get to say, it's this book that I wrote when I was in jail for civil disobedience, it's about how we create a better world by dissolving government entirely. A more peaceful, productive, and harmonious world. And most people say, hmm, sounds like a good idea. And when you present this message properly, when you're clear about why you're doing this, why you care, what the objective is, when you stay in the love behind this message, you'll find that people are a lot more receptive to it. Now, I think that what we do as libertarian activists sometimes is like dragging government along by the imperfect leash of democracy to be more in line with public opinion. Right? You look at marijuana as an example. You know, as libertarians, we're all just Republicans who smoke pot, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, why do we talk about this issue a lot? Why is marijuana important to libertarians? It obviously speaks to the core of what our message is about. And the fact that we're at this point where we are today with the end of the beginning of the end of the war on drugs, it's a beautiful thing to see that people are waking up through this issue because marijuana shouldn't be legal because it's safer than alcohol or has these medical or industrial properties. No, marijuana should be legal because no one but you has the right to decide what you put in your own body. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is the part of my presentation where I normally have all these great jokes about weed being illegal, but you guys ruined it for me. So, congratulations, Colorado. Yeah, we're going to... Medi yeah, medical mushrooms next, right? Medical heroin, medical MDMA. You guys are... Is that like one more, one more election cycle in Colorado, right? Well, the, the way I say it is, you know, in the rest of the country, they made weed so legal it's not even fun to smoke anymore. So, like, you guys really did ruin it here for everybody. <laughs> But this is, this is an important issue. It speaks to the core you know, of, of the philosophy, right? Self-ownership, non-aggression principle, voluntarism. And if you look at even California with medical decades ago, public opinion changed long before the policy did, right? So when people ask me about freedom now on the street, you know, just meeting regular Americans, a lot of them will say, so what are you doing about it? And I get to say, well, I'm getting ready to run for president in 2020 on the platform of dissolving the entire federal government. Yeah. Are we in the right room? Hold on one more time. Dissolving the entire federal government. Yeah. All right. So in the process of waking up, right, or realizing that you're a libertarian or becoming libertarian, because we all are inherently, right, if a libertarian is someone who believes in free will, Everybody who has a free will is a libertarian, right? It just is beaten out of us and conditioned out of us, or we don't embrace that inherently because we're trained not to. And a lot of the times we've seen how people wake up, right? And it's usually they're shedding their delusions about the state, kind of one after another. Well, we need government for this. We need government for that. And then you go, oh, well, no, that's not an excuse for violence. That's not an excuse for violence. Yeah, maybe people should be free. Similarly, I've gone through a bit of an awakening or shedding of delusions in terms of my activism, and I've been doing this for 10 years now. And one of the delusions that, that I was laboring under was that we have to wake up everybody. If we don't get regular Americans to read a 
pile of a dozen books and understand Austrian business cycle theory and monetary policy, then we're all doomed. <laughs> you guys know how hard it is to get Americans to read books these days, right? So like, obviously that, that can't be the answer. Right? And by the way, you guys have noticed we live in a communist country from each according to their ability. We have a progressive income tax to each according to their need. We have a massive welfare state. There was never a vote on that. There's never a communist education program where we got every American to say, yeah, we want to do that, right? So obviously we don't have to educate everybody to that level of understanding. By the way, this is where I get to point out that my book happens to be banned in US prisons and jails. Or, or rather, I should say, it's been endorsed by the United States Department of Justice. Because yeah. <laughs> we sent a copy in to an inmate and we got a rejection letter from the warden saying that the entire publication, because they have to say what part by law and why, is a threat to the good order, security, and discipline of the institution. Wow. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't have written a better endorsement myself. Okay, so how many of you have heard of agorism or agorism? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah? Awesome, okay. of course, well-educated crowd here at Ernie's. This is Sam Pompkin's idea of counter-economics, withdrawing your material support for the state, not paying taxes, working under the table, using barter, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Any fans of Bitcoin here tonight? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. And this is a great idea, right? You can live more free, you can pay less in taxes, you can have a more ethical life by not contributing materially to the state. But if that was gonna work, we would have to get 95 plus percent of the population on board. Because if the other 5% really is enthusiastically supporting the state and making sure that they have the guns and control of the printing presses, we're still screwed. And if you don't believe me, how many of you know how many Americans, percentage of the population, voted in the first American constitutional presidential election? Anybody? It's white landowning males allowed only at the time, and it was less than 2% of the population who voted. And the people trying to form that strong central government under the Constitution, they didn't say, oh, shucks, I guess we got to go home. We don't have a mandate. No, they said, screw you, we're the government anyway. So government exists with an illusion of public consent. Without trigger pullers, cops and soldiers willing to point guns at innocent people, the state cannot exist. And in order for them to be able to do that today, they have to maintain this illusion of public consent. So if we want to build a freer world, we have to address that primary underpinning of the state, which means we are going to have to get political. Still less embarrassing than Donald Trump. <laughs> so, yo dog, I heard you trust the government. So I got you some fluoridated water, WMDs from Iraq, safe alternatives to marijuana. I know you guys have been looking for those here, right? And a constitution that will protect your rights. Now, it's really tempting to say the Constitution is a failed experiment. We didn't, we didn't vote hard enough. We didn't watch our government officials close enough. But that would be intellectually dishonest, wouldn't it? The Constitution is a very successful experiment at concentrating wealth and power in the hands of the few at the expense of the many. And it's time we figure out what it really is. And I think the American people are ready to see through it because it explains a lot of the problems we've been having to take an honest look at the founding documents of our government. Now, in his talk, Mr. Cole, he said that as libertarians, we should be agnostic about taxes and regulations. And I was like, whoa, 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 hey, we just, we, we kind of decided this already. We've, you know, guys have gotten this as a tattoo already. We're not, we're not backing off from this position, all right? If we had the ideal libertarian social order, right, if, if government disappeared tomorrow, people would still come together and form groups. 
this is where like I, I don't really like the word anarchist, except in the, if you define it properly to mean no rulers. It's it's really not no government. If you have a local community and it's all voluntary and it's a, a homeowners association with high dues and rules, I'm not going to put a gun to your head and say no, you can't call that a government because it doesn't meet my technical definition, right? We're going to respect the right of individuals to come together voluntarily to form communities. If it's voluntary, if it's based on private property, we don't have a problem with that. And that really, I think, gets to an important part of our message that, that I think a lot of us forget when, when this message gets politicized. Is that it's not about the aesthetics. It's not about the resulting look of society or organization or where money goes from who to there or what, whatever. It's about the ethics. Is it voluntary? I wrote a, a blog post recently called, Can Communism Be a Type of Libertarianism? And I make the case that yes, if you want, a communist commune, you want a city community organization, and it's all voluntary, and it respects the individual right to private property in entering that community and in leaving it, then we don't have a problem with that. That would be a libertarian organization, right? Similarly, every household, every family, right, is a communist or socialist organization that's voluntary. We don't have an objection to that. Now, what he was saying is that if all government was localized down to the community level where it was essentially voluntary, what do we care what level the taxation is? What do we care what the regulations are? And this suggests not just an important new strategy for our movement, but a new approach to outreach and bringing people in. Again, by getting more hardcore, by getting more principled, by sticking to the philosophy that is inherent to every human individual free will on this earth. So when someone comes to you and says, I think government should do X, what's the typical libertarian response? No, no heck no, hell no. <laughs> and let me argue with you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to explain to you why I'm right and you're wrong. And that is not a good way to win friends or influence people. So when someone says, I think government should do X, your typical status, right? They're not saying things like, well, I think government should be able to lock people up for smoking a plant. I think government should be able to lose $6 trillion of taxpayer money whenever it feels like it. I think government should be able to drone strike wedding parties on the other side of the planet. No, when people say this, they're saying in good faith, this is something that I would like to see provided. This is a function I would like to see achieved in society. So what if instead someone says, I think government should do X, you say, well, okay, are you okay if, if government does X just in your community? And when you have government doing X just in your community, are you okay with not raising an army and forcing your policy on your neighboring communities? Well, guess what? Then you're a libertarian. <laughs> And this is how we bring people together, not just uniting all of the splinter groups within the freedom movement, because we can't agree on shit anyway. <laughs> the one true libertarian, right? No, that doesn't exist. And if we want to be a political debate club, we can keep arguing philosophy and principles all day long. And we can push people away and tell them they're not libertarian enough for us. But if we want to become a political force, all we have to do is put forth practical policy that immediately improves everyone's lives. So to the platform, yes, this is tech support. Your government is doing what? <laughs> Have you tried turning it off and back on again? <laughs> Which of course begs the question, if you could turn your government off, why would you ever turn it back on? <laughs> So this platform comes down to one executive order. And I want to make really clear about this, uh, or be really clear about this. Right now, we're saying that I'm running for not president. And that's primarily because we're not filing FEC paperwork yet. It's also more accurate to say that I'm running for not president. Because I don't think there's anything more unlibertarian or anti-freedom you can say than, I want to be president of the United States. I want to be in charge of this giant violent institution and impose my wonderful libertarian ideas on the entire country as opposed to saying, I'm going to throw the ring in the fire. I don't want this power to exist at all. We're going to push it down locally, respect the right of self-determination of individuals and communities, and if we have to, as an intermediary step of the states of the union. So what we are doing with this campaign is turning the US presidential election into a national referendum on whether or not 
the federal government should be allowed to continue to exist at all. So it comes down to one executive order. I'm going to go in, the very first thing I do, sign this one order in which I resign from being President of the United States to custodian of the federal government. And I know there's some joke in here about politicians and cleaning up and draining the swamp, but I'm sure I couldn't do it without insulting perfectly moral, ethical people who do legitimate services by actually cleaning people's homes every day as opposed to the politicians who just screw everything up. So, <laughs> the executive order contains my resignation that says what I'm doing is not going in to be president, but going in as a bankruptcy agent for the purposes of dissolving this institution and paying back the real creditors of the American federal government. This executive order also contains the appointees for each agency, not to be secretary of X, but custodian of each department for the purpose of carrying out what is as much as possible a preordained process laid out in as much detail as we can commit to so that the American people, when they go to vote in November 2020, will know exactly what they are voting for. The executive order will be on the website months in advance. Sometimes I get asked the question, is it constitutional? Heck no, it's not constitutional. That's kind of the point. <laughs> we are invoking the higher authority known as the Declaration of Independence, which says we have not only a right, but a duty to alter and abolish systems of government that no longer serve us. I'm a veteran myself. And when we travel the country, I always, always like to ask, by the way, I'm not going to make you stand up and blow smoke up your butts. How many of y'all are veterans? Or active duty even? Awesome. Okay. How often do you go to the VA? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> universally, all over the country, the answer is some version of as little as possible. And we have a problem in this country, right? 22 veterans committing suicide a day. Now I can tell you from my experience, when I went to the VA, when I was having trouble sleeping when I got back from Iraq, I walked out of there with a little brown paper bag, five prescriptions, three of them had suicide listed as a side effect. They are literally killing America's veterans on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry while keeping natural treatments illegal. The VA does not exist to take care of veterans. It exists to make it look like they care about veterans so they can keep convincing gullible young people to enlist as poor men dying in rich men's wars. So what do we do about this? The way we stop it is by privatization, or as I say, liberate these agencies. And now we think of privatization in government terms. Government privatization, you take broadly available public resources, put them in the hands of a few rich assholes, right? Ethical privatization, surprise, surprise, represents the opposite of that. Taking resources that have been claimed by a few people who don't deserve them and putting them in the hands of the people who have an actual legitimate interest in them. So with the VA, there's no reason it shouldn't exist. It just can't be funded by taxes anymore. So what do we do? We liberate it, spin it off, privatize it, give it an endowment as we liquidate the federal government and give every veteran in America one ownership voting share. And when you put those resources directly in the hands of veterans, I guarantee you will not have 22 veterans committing suicide a day in this country anymore. So this is it. The new direction for the freedom movement, localization. It happens to be the everybody gets what they want strategy. You're a liberal, a conservative, a moderate, it doesn't matter. We want government localized to the community level where your vote and your voice have a chance of mattering. And the cool thing about this is that if we really adopt this, if we really embrace this as a movement, if we really get in touch with our core principles at this level, where we're willing to give up our aesthetics and respect the right of self-determination of communities, we not only unite all of the various splinter groups within the movement, the anarchists, the minarchists, the constitutionalists, whatever, it doesn't matter. We are uniting left, right, and center against the common enemy that is big, centralized government. And this is the opportunity for the Libertarian Party and our freedom movement to go from being a debate club to being a political force. And all we have to do is stop debating how many Libertarian angels can dance on the head of a pin and instead put forth practical 
policy that immediately improves everyone's lives. Can you get on board with that? <laughs> 900 bases in 153 countries is not fighting for your freedom. It is an empire. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was a little afraid that the biggest objection to this campaign, this platform right away would be, but without a military, who's going to keep us safe? From what? And you can't even answer the question because it's a silly, nonsensical question based on a false premise. Having a military makes us less safe. This is why the founders of this country were opposed to the idea of a standing army entirely. They knew that a militia was the only legitimate defense of a free people and that the government's monopoly military version of that would have all the problems as with any monopoly. Militias defend people, militaries defend government's ability to rule people. Now I'm not just talking about the symptomatic effects of this that I witnessed in Fallujah in 2004 where we made enemies faster than we could kill them. Obviously because the global war on terror wasn't designed to be won, it was engineered to be continued as long as possible because it was always about money and power and exploitation, never about freedom, never about any of the reasons they told us, right? So that's one symptom of trusting your security to government. But it's even more fundamental than that. And to get this, you have to understand how we have been lied to from a very young age about war itself. We are told that wars are fought between countries. It's America versus Japan versus Germany versus China versus Russia. And they play on our fears of the others, of outsiders. They play on our nationalism, our sense of identity that comes through government. But you think about it for a second, when you understand what government is, you understand how and why wars happen, you know wars are not fought between countries. They are conducted by governments using violence to expand their protection rackets. And when you tell your government, please rule me, govern me, tax my income, subject me to your monopoly defense services, well, guess what? That's what makes you a really juicy target for another government that would come in and do what? Govern you, like you're being governed now. Except that if a new government had to start from scratch, it would probably take them what? I don't know, a couple hundred years before we could get to the point we're at today with the average American working for government over half the year when you add up all the fees, fines, and hidden taxes associated with government. Holy crap, we should be so lucky to have another government come in and kick ours out and have to start from scratch. We'd be a lot more free. Fact is, the founders were absolutely right when they asserted that the best defense is a well-armed population that refuses to be governed by anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Or, as James Madison put it somewhat more eloquently, the means of defense against foreign danger have been always the instruments of tyranny at home. Among the Romans, it was a standing maxim to excite a war whenever a revolt was apprehended. Throughout all Europe, the armies kept up under the pretext of defending have enslaved the people. How many of y'all follow the Bundy Ranch story at all? Yeah, exciting news this week, some progress there because a lot of people have come out and support them, so thank you for everybody who has done that. But you know, if you follow the original Bunkerville standoff, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, has a standing army. The TSA, I know, it's really easy to laugh at them, right? But if they were all hired to dig ditches and fill them back up, we'd be a lot safer than this kabuki security theory and the false sense of security it gives us. But yeah, that's a huge standing army. And I suppose, I mean, here in, in Phoenix, like anywhere else in the country, like any big city, we have the militarization of local police with federal tax dollars. And you might not be surprised to know that the IRS has SWAT teams, right? But so does the Department of Education. We are literally surrounded by the standing armies that our founders warned us against. 
And make no mistake, if you want to stand up for freedom, you have to directly confront militarism because it is the violent underpinning of the state. Obviously, we live in rapidly accelerating times, and the Internet is a major driving force in this. You can't lie to us the way that you used to be able to and get away with it. Ludwig von Mises said that when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. Or in other words, people who trade don't fight. We live in the most globally interconnected, not just in information, but in commerce, world that we have ever experienced by far. And it's no coincidence that we live in the most peaceful times in human history. You are less likely today than ever before to be subject to violence at the hands of another human being. I say go team people. This is awesome. A beautiful thing to celebrate. Especially when you understand the relationship between freedom and nonviolence. And it's not just that people are waking up in a way that they don't go back to sleep because we now have, as Ernie calls it, the truth button right there, one click away at our fingertips. Because we don't need everybody to understand philosophy, the non-aggression principle. They don't even have to care about politics because there's something even more fundamental that is shifting. We are no longer bound by tradition the way that we used to be. The idea that it has to be that way because it's always been that way is totally irrelevant in the age of the internet. And you see it in the headlines today, Catalonia, Kurdistan, and the Spanish government thinks that in the age of the internet they can get away with pointing guns at people who are going to peacefully vote to say we don't want to be a part of your big collective anymore? I don't think so. The British vote, Brexit, the Scottish vote for independence, in the United States, Vermont, New Hampshire, the Republic of Texas, the 51st State Project in Northeastern Colorado, Jefferson State, Northern California, Southern Oregon, Hawaii, Alaska, even California wants to break off from the Union now. We, we wouldn't miss them, would we? <laughs> All right. There's a global secessionist movement just starting because people will demand the right to self-determination in their communities when they know it's an option, when they know that government is what is keeping us all from getting what we want. And about the productivity, I know this is just sort of a, a little economic <laughs> sidebar here, but I was studying for a debate on immigration recently and came across a most incredible economic statistic that if we got rid of government borders just as impediments to the free flow of labor, global productivity would double. Double. Let that sink in. Just that one policy of government changing means that either quality of life would double for every human being on the planet, or we'd all have to work half as much. What we are on the brink of in terms of human evolution is a whole new era that government is holding us back from. And like I said at the beginning, when you lead this message with why you're doing it, because we want to create a more peaceful, productive, and harmonious world, you see that it's inevitable for us to achieve, one way or another, a critical mass to achieve this change. All right, so this is me in Fallujah in 2004. I'll spare you all the war stories tonight. But I want to share just a little bit about my personal motivation in this. And one of my favorite Ron Paul quotes is, you don't have to go to Iraq to read the Constitution. <laughs> Remember when people were still debating whether or not the war in Iraq was a good idea and that was relevant, is it constitutional or not? But Dr. Paul was making, I think, a bigger point with that statement as well. You don't have to go to war and see it firsthand yourself to know that it is the greatest evil that humanity is capable of. And for me, it's a little bit more personal than that because I learned Arabic on my way to Iraq to be better at my job in civil affairs, to be helping children in Iraq like these. And during the siege of Fallujah in April 2004, I was called to guard a couple of detainees who had been caught trying to leave the city. And this is when it was under continuous 
C-130 Spectre gunship bombardment, artillery from the sky. If you're not trying to meet 72 virgins, you're trying to get out of the city. And when I came to these men, they were sitting on a cement floor, cross-legged, with sandbags over their heads, and their hands zip tied behind their backs. And they had been forced to sit in that position for about 12 hours by the time I got there. Now, technically, that's not a stress position. But I dare you to try it. Try just not being allowed to go to the bathroom for 12 hours and see how that feels. And so I was ordered that night to guard these men in this little guard shack right next to the Euphrates River, right across where the bridge is that the four Blackwater security agents were strung up and burned on in, a, in the incident that precipitated the siege of Fallujah in April 2004. And when I got there, I was told that my orders were to keep them awake. So sleep deprivation torture to soften them up for interrogation. And what I should have done is said, hey, you know that Geneva Conventions card you gave us a couple months ago? kind of says we're not supposed to do this. But you know what I did? I followed orders. And that night, I used my Arabic to taunt those men. So for me, it's not just that war is the greatest evil that humanity is capable of, but that government is, taking, is capable of taking even the most well-intentioned people and putting them in a position where they are doing that greatest evil that humanity is capable of directly to another person. Yeah. So, imagine if everyone was this passionate about things that actually matter. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Dr. Mary J. Ruart? Oh, wow. That's awesome. So, y'all probably have heard of her book, Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression. Now this is one that was instrumental in my awakening. But just that phrase, think about that for a second. Because I really can't think of a better way of describing what we are doing as a movement. Healing our world in an age of aggression. So if you'll give me just a little bit of analogy freedom here, I'd like to compare becoming a libertarian to driving down the freeway, coming upon the scene of a major accident while simultaneously becoming a doctor. You guys follow that a little bit, right? Because, you know, when you start to pay attention to the evils of government, you want to be better at doing something about it, right? You all have done something to educate yourself, so you at least understand government better, if not to be more capable as an activist being involved. And by the way, uh, my definition of an activist is someone who's motivated by a deep-seated sense of injustice. So if you were an activist at the beginning of the evening, I hope you will be by the end of tonight, but you educate yourself, right? Because you want to be better. You want to be more engaged. At the same time, you're much more aware of the pain and suffering caused by government. So it's like you see how big the accident is. And of course, as activists, a lot of us interrupt our lives. We stop what we're doing, all the better things, more fun things, less stressful things we could be doing to pull over because we want to help, right? So now imagine you get to the side of the road and you find a dozen people bleeding to death. And you know that with two hands, <coughs> you could jump in and save one person. But if you do, the other 11 are probably going to die. So of course you get up and you scream for help, right? And as activists, a lot of us have this experience because we just need hands. We don't need more doctors. We don't need to read more books. We just need people to show up. We just need help. We just need hands to stop the bleeding. We just, we're, just, we're trying to help people. And it's maddening when you realize that most people are like the ones driving past in the fast lane. Like they can't even hear you. Like they don't care. And it's tempting to get angry at them, but it doesn't help because we have to acknowledge that a lot of them are dealing with their own medical, legal, financial, whatever issues, their own victimization at the hands of the state in their own way. Maybe they're not ready to help out. But that's not most Americans, is it? Most Americans are more like the ones driving past in the slow lane. And you know they can hear you through the glass and you know they can see the accident, even if they're watching the fake news mainstream media, because the greatest crimes of government are not done in secret, they're done in the open. And it's maddening, it's so frustrating, 
You want to get angry. Sometimes you want to give up. And I've seen a lot of people in 10 years of activism come and go. I've seen a lot of people burn out. And a lot of it's because it's motivated by that negative emotional response to the state, that anger. But even for people who get past that, there's this frustration that comes. When you, when you get to this point and you're yelling for help, you're doing everything you can, can I just get some more hands? And it seems like people don't care to say, fuck it. I'm not going to worry about that anymore. I'm just, I'm going to save one person. I'm just going to get my hands on here. I'm going to do this thing. It's one thing in my community. I'm going to deal with this one issue. But eventually, it gets to feel like you're playing whack-a-mole with the state, doesn't it? You knock down one thing, and another one comes up, and they just keep coming and coming. Maybe it's more like cutting heads off a of hydra, right? Government just keeps growing and getting bigger and getting worse. And if you play their game, if you fight inch by inch, you're going to win some battles. But what's going to happen? They're going to pat you on the head and say, oh, good little citizen, you follow the democratic process. Here's an Obama phone and an I voted sticker. Now go pay your taxes. I say, fuck that. I don't want to play that game anymore. I want to knock the legs out from underneath the whole goddamn table. So what are we asking you to do tonight specifically? Number one, sign up to be a delegate. Get active with the LP. Number two, defend the brand. Help us make sure that when people hear the word libertarian, they understand what it means. That's why we have to get a message of ethics, the true message of freedom, out front if we want to change the world. Number three, donate money, time, or in kind. Number four, join a special team, and this is a big part of this campaign. A lot of libertarians have this misconception that the state needs a confrontation, a conflict, a fight in order to be defeated. And that's not the case. Number five, win converts. Now, we kind of shy away from this language, but you know that we're not converting people to any dogma. The conversion is to thinking for yourself, which is actually more important than converting them to libertarianism because we know if they're thinking for themselves, they'll be libertarian eventually anyway, right? <laughs> so in that vein, my book, it's free here tonight. Free in every digital format possible, of course. And this tour has been made possible by enough people who have read this book and have donated to pay it forward to make it possible to travel the country and give these books away for free everywhere. And I can humbly say that this is the ultimate red pill, and it's because we had a lot of help. We had over 300 people contribute to the editing process, so it's something that you can share with confidence. And finally, number six... <laughs> Be awesome to everyone. Now, you don't hear that at a lot of political events, but while some libertarians are quick to point out that our philosophy is just this singular point of self-ownership and voluntarism and the non-aggression principle, I would make the case that there's a clear, irrefutable implication of that, which is that if you're here tonight, it's because you care. And if you care, it's because you care about people. You care about making the world a better place for people. And if you're a capitalist, you want to provide value, right? We don't have to wait for a stateless society to provide stateless solutions, to provide value in every exchange, in every relationship, in every interaction. And it will radically change your life if you adopt this policy. So if people are telling jokes and they're hard to laugh at like mine, laugh at them anyway. <laughs> This is not an instructional slide. <laughs> this is a warning. When you go out and talk to people about these issues, you are going to be dealing with emotional, irrational people. Why? Because people are emotional and irrational. Even libertarians, get over yourselves. This is a warning so that when you face this, you're ready for it, and you don't get dragged down to this level because you're able to stay in the love and compassion that's behind this message. This is a technical diagram. I'm going to leave this up here for a minute so everybody can figure out exactly how to... So we're going to need everybody's help in this. Okay. Now, I've been told you're never going to win because they're going to shoot you first. And that's not going to stop me. I have risked my life for far less worthy causes before. They've also said you're not going to win 
because they're going to cheat. And it's true that elections can be stolen. They can keep people off the ballot. But in this day and age, they can really only cheat so much around the margins when we have polling and exit polls and the kind of accountability that comes with that. I mean, we are going to need a clear, overwhelming <coughs> mandate. We are going to need somewhere around 60% in order to pull this off. Now, I want to make something absolutely clear. This is not an educational campaign. We are running to win, and we will be ready to win, and we will put forth a practical policy alternative in this executive order so that every American knows they have the option to vote nobody for president in 2020. And if we hit that black swan moment, if we come to that paradigm shift, if we truly have indeed already won, then that's it. All we have to do is get this plan in front of the American people in a credible way. But I want you to know when I'm in asking you to invest in this effort that I can be realistic too. And if we don't hit that black swan moment, if all we do is maintain the linear progression of our movement, and it's not linear, it's exponential. But if all we do is maintain that, I think it's very reasonable to expect that in 2020, we are going to have a breakout year for the Libertarian Party, and we are going to crack 10%, and we are going to plant the flag on this idea indelibly in the minds of every single American that they are better off without the federal government. But regardless, I will continue to run on this platform until the federal government ceases to exist one way or another. Yeah. All right, so just to wrap things up, we have some fun highlights about what it means to end the Fed. First, no more IRS. Yeah, it's a real easy crowd pleaser, right? Who wants a big pay raise? No more inflation tax. Yeah. All right, so you all understand monetary policy. No more federal gun laws. No more FCC, and especially for the internet, more freedom of speech. No more FDA, that means no more war on drug users. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit longer list. No more militarization of local police, at least with federal tax dollars. No more Department of Justice. That means we get to immediately release the Bundys, Schaefer Cox, Leonard Peltier, Ross Ulbricht, and immediately pardon Edward Snowden. No more political prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> no more Department of Homeland Security. That means no more TSA. Yeah. Sorry for those of you who actually enjoy getting groped at the airports. And because forcing your children to pay for things that they never had a say in is intergenerational child abuse, no more national debt. Okay, it's gonna, there, there are, there are a lot of benefits to dissolving the federal government. I, trust me, this is the short list, guys. No more BLM. That's not Black Lives Matter. That's Bureau of Land Management. No more Bureau of Indian Affairs, which means that sovereign native tribes actually get to become sovereign native tribes, and we can do at least something to honor so many broken treaties. <clears throat> No more NSA. I know it's the only part of government that actually listens. No more ATF. If Ernie doesn't beat me to it, I'll be the first one to open the convenience store. No more CIA. No more FBI. No more military industrial complex. And most importantly, no more daylight saving time. Every generation needs a new revolution. Now, I hope that all of you understand what we are doing is much more evolutionary than revolutionary. But make no mistake, what we are doing with this campaign, including with this gathering here tonight, will be written in the history books as nothing less than the final American revolution. This is our time. This is our opportunity. 
This is our generation's chance to stand up and take charge and live up to the promise of our founders. And it's possible now because enough Americans have realized that we don't have to be united under one government to be united in American values, and we are certainly too good for this government. So we are going to fulfill the promise of the first American Revolution, once again overthrow the biggest empire that the world has ever seen, and finally free America. Thank you very much. Yeah.